Uh, we're going to give it a few, another minute or so, and give a little bit more time for people to join in, and we'll get started soon. All right, everyone. Happy Wednesday. Hope everyone's doing doing well. Hoping for that Seattle sun to come back. Um, in the interest of time, I think we're going to get started. And uh, if people come in, um, Ritza will help them uh, get in on our uh, program. Uh, my name is Arturo. I'm one of the many staff here at Neighborhood House, and I am part of the development team. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today for the launch of our speaker series. Uh, we hope these virtual events are opportunities to engage and learn about Neighborhood House, our community, and how to grow together uh, to achieve our vision of a healthy, diverse, and welcoming community free of poverty and racism uh, where all people thrive. Um, we would like to remind you today uh, that this event will be recorded for others to watch that could not make it today. Uh, your cameras and mics will be turned off during the presentation until our Q&A time at the end. Everyone is welcome to send confidential questions through the chat. Uh, please make sure to select on the option uh, to open up your chat and there should be an option on the drop down menu to send uh, questions to Janelle, uh, our co-host. Um, please do not share any personal, confidential, or medical information in any of your questions. Um, we'll also have um, Janelle stand by, on standby to ask those confidential questions, and then at the end, we'll let, the, let everyone have an opportunity to turn on their cameras and ask in person as well. Next slide. Um, so uh, to get us started, I first want to introduce Diana Park Bowen, a uh, neighborhood house staff member who will do the honors of starting us off with our land acknowledgements. Thank you, Arturo. Um, neighborhood house recognizes that we are on indigenous lands, specifically the lands of Coast Salish people. We offer acknowledgement to our Coast Salish relatives and cultures, including the Duwamish, the Squamish, the Snoqualmie, the Muckleshoot, and many of the other loose shoot seed speaking communities and people. We recognize that we serve communities on lands governed by the 1855 Treaty of Point Elliott, a treaty that has not been fully honored. Neighborhood House also recognizes that we serve indigenous people who are in King County due to forced relocation from their traditional homelands, and that many of our resources come from sources that have created inequities for indigenous people. Thank you, Diana, for reading that. Um, and now I'd like to introduce our amazing speaker for the day, Leah Post. Uh, Leah Post joined the Neighborhood House Community Health Management Team in January 2019. She moved to Seattle from Minneapolis, where she was born and raised. Leah received her undergraduate degree in gender, women, and sexuality studies, her master's in public health, and her master's in social work from the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. She is an independently licensed clinical social worker who has been providing individual, family, and group mental health therapy since 2016. Leah has been working in nonprofits and advocating for mental health care in underserved communities since 2011. She is passionate about engaging community leaders in providing culturally responsive information, care, and resources. Thank you, Leah. Big round of applause. Woo! Thanks, Arturo, um, and thanks everyone for being here. Um, 
I want to thank you all. I know this this is our first speaker series, so um, bear with us if any technical problems happen, but I know that the development team is wonderful. So um, if anyone has any questions, just a reminder to put them in the chat. Um, I definitely want to get to all your questions, but I want to make sure too that we get through the slides. Um, and also just a reminder, um, although I am a clinical therapist, my role here is to really talk about mental health in general. So um, I can't provide like clinical consultation or anything like that to any individual, but I am happy to provide referrals if anyone has um, any specific needs or questions. So today um, we are going to go really broad in talking about mental health. Uh, we're gonna talk about the definition of mental health and mental illness. We are gonna briefly touch on COVID because there has been an impact on mental illness during COVID. Um, and then we're gonna talk a lot about stigma and what that looks like both in the United States and around the world. Um, and of course, touching on cultural considerations because while mental health can happen to anyone anywhere, um, it looks very different in many different cultures. So that's where we're gonna start. Um, so what is mental health? Uh, I am gonna read a little bit off the slides, but I also may go on tangents. So um, that's why we are recording. So feel free to look back if, if you miss anything. So mental health is a state of well-being in which an individual realizes their own abilities, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively, and is able to make a contribution to their community. It is fundamental to our collective and individual ability as humans to think, emote, interact with each other, earn a living, and enjoy life. Um, so as you can see, too, a lot of this seems really vague, and that's the point. Um, like, for example, the word normal uh, for normal stresses is going to look different to every person. Um, the goal of mental health is that whatever your normal is or whatever your baseline is, um, we want you to feel good about it. Um, all right, so I know that some of these slides might have a lot of words on them, and I apologize. Um, but when they send them out, you will notice that at the bottom I have everything cited. So if you want more information about any of the information, uh, you are welcome to look into that. Uh, so mental health is more than just the absence of a mental disorder or mental illness. Um, it's an integral part of health, um, and there is no health without mental health. Sometimes people don't think about mental health when considering physical health, but it absolutely plays a factor. Um, mental health is determined by a range of socioeconomic, biological, and environmental factors. So it's never just one thing. Um, our biology, our genetics does play a role. Um, also where we grow up, how we grew up, um, the environment in which we live, all of that plays a role in our mental health. And sometimes people may be born into situations where the risk factors are higher um, or the protective factors, so things that um, increase the likelihood of positive mental health um, are also higher. So in the United States, um, and we are gonna talk about the world too, but in the US, one in four adults will experience mental illness during their lifetime, which means that this is really common. So even though we may not talk about it all the time, it is definitely something that is very, very common. I can almost guarantee with certainty that all of you know someone in your life, whether known or not, um, but all of you have a person in your life that um, has experienced mental illness or will experience it in their lifetime. Um, so there is a lot of stigma associated with mental health. Um, so stigma is negative attitudes and negative behaviors towards a, a thing. In this case, we're talking about mental health. Um, and so we're gonna talk more about that, but um, that does play a role in why you may not know that mental health problems are as common as they are. Um, in general, there's a lot of misinformation about mental health, um, including mental illness and also seeking treatment. So many people just aren't well informed and that is no one's fault. Um, I think a lot of that has to do with stigma, but that's one of the reasons we're here today. So hopefully um, at least you'll leave uh, this presentation with a little more understanding. Um, and then also a lot of times because of stigma, maybe due to cultural considerations, maybe because someone doesn't know how to access care, a lot of people, specifically adults with mental health problems often don't seek help. Um, so in the US, only 41% of folks who um, had a mental disorder received any professional help, um, which is not very many. If you think about one in four um, adults experiencing that, uh, that means a lot of those people are not uh, reaching out for help that um, could be beneficial to them. Uh, 
So in thinking about what mental health is, um, we're gonna talk about mental health disorders or mental illness. Um, you may hear me interchange them. They are very interchangeable. Um, so, and we can talk more about that if, if anyone would like to. So a mental health disorder is a diagnosable illness that affects a person's thinking, emotional state and behavior. Um, and when I say diagnosable, uh, in the United States at least, there is only one book that we use to diagnose mental illness, it's the DSM. I'm sure many of you have at least heard of that before. So right now we are on the DSM-5. It's a, I don't have it with me, but it's a pretty thick book. Um, and it is redone about once every 20 years. So that is the book essentially that is used for what we are calling mental illness in, in this definition. Um, mental illness uh, disrupts the person's ability to work, carry out daily activities, and engage in satisfying relationships. Um, and mental illness, uh, again, even though we don't talk about it, it can be very disabling. It can be more disabling than many chronic physical illnesses. Um, so based on many studies done, the disability from moderate depression is similar to the impact from relapsing multiple scler sclerosis, severe asthma, or chronic hepatitis B. And the disability from severe depression is comparable to the disability from quadriplegia. And quadriplegia is someone who doesn't have use of their arms or legs. And so while mental illness, um, as, as it is defined, um, is, affects our brain, um, it's very something that can absolutely impact our um, bodies as well. So it's not just something that um, people can just get over. Mental health is something that definitely needs treatment. It needs more than just um, kind of like getting over it. So that's something that we'll dig into a little bit. Um, all right, so we can go to the next one. Awesome. So this is just a um, very broad um, graph of prevalence of any mental illness among adults. Uh, so this is not um, about specific mental illness, but this is in general. So it's broken down into a couple different categories. The most recent data is from 2019. Um, and I also like to point out that often things go unreported or underreported. So these numbers are probably lower than they actually, like the true numbers are. So if you look um, at kind of some of the, the trends, the average is 20%. So 20% of adults in the United States um, experienced any mental illness in 2019. Um, and if you look, the age range that um, has higher rates are gonna be younger folks, 18 to 25. Um, and then also if we're looking at racial categories, um, people that identify with two or more racial identities um, also have a significantly higher um, prevalence of mental illness. So these are just things to consider as we're going through this. Um, so like I said, I wanna briefly touch on COVID and mental health. Um, of course, COVID is still happening. So um, there's gonna be a lot that we continue to learn about it. Um, so this is just kind of like pre-numbers, numbers that have come out since it started. Um, the, the data keeps changing constantly, but we do show that the number of people with symptoms of depression has increased since um, this time last year. Um, upwards of 34%, um, which is a really big number. And again, this is in Washington state. So this is actually even a smaller number of folks than the United States, but in Washington state, um, there's been shown an increase of 34% in some communities. Again, mental health is often unreported or underreported. So a lot of times these numbers are lower than we think they are. Um, also a little side note on there, those who lost employment, those who have incomes less than 35,000 per year, and then people who self-identified in non-white race categories were more likely to report feelings of depression. Um, and that is uh, common across the board, not just since COVID, um, but those numbers have increased even more rapidly in those communities. Um, as a mental health provider myself, I have seen a very, very high increase in demand for mental health services. And right now there are simply not enough providers, uh, it seems, um, to uh, help with the need. So it is something that the mental health provider community is uh, feeling for sure. And also um, I always have to remind folks that therapists are people too. 
And so uh, the impact that it has on us personally is also something um, that we're working through. So uh, COVID has definitely, definitely had an impact. Um, and then if we talk about King County, so um, there's gonna be a lot of resources that we're gonna talk about. King County has a crisis line and that crisis line is used for folks that might be feeling um, that they um, have suicidal thoughts, suicidal behaviors, they have no one to talk to, it's a 24 hour crisis line. Um, and they noticed that the number of calls has increased 12% um, since the start of COVID, which is, is quite a bit considering the amount of uh, residents in King County and how frequently that line is used. Um, so again, I just wanted to touch on this. COVID is definitely having an impact and many of those impacts are coming not only from loss of jobs, um, really, really tight finances, it's also coming from uh, the isolation of COVID, um, the inability to socialize with friends, with family, um, even coworkers, not being able to be in a place where we can have human interaction has a really big impact on us as adults and us as human beings. Um, so although I'm not an expert on COVID and mental health, I did want to uh, put a slide in here to recognize that mental health has been increasing or the need for mental health services has been increasing drastically since at least April of 2020 when we started gathering data on it. Um, so this is um, a similar COVID slide. I apologize, it's a little fuzzy, um, but this is again a King County slide. So if you look at the darker shades of color, so in the top is by age, um, the orange, and then the purple is ethnicity, and the kind of turquoise green is by race. And the percentage of emergency department visits related to suicidal ideation. And if you look, this is actually a very small time frame. So March to May of 2020 versus March to May of 2019. So just one year later, and it was essentially the beginning of COVID. And the um, number or the colors that are dark, the darker orange, the darker purple, the darker green, those are the 2020 numbers versus the lighter colors are the 2019. So even on this chart, you can see in virtually every single age category and every ethnic and racial category, um, the percent of emergency department visits related to suicidal ideation has increased since COVID started. Um, so I definitely wanna recognize and um, acknowledge that this is a really hard time for a lot of people across the board. Um, especially for our communities with folks that have been impacted greatly by COVID, including job loss. Um, so I just wanted to, to show this as kind of a visual of, of some of the impacts of mental health, um, COVID on mental health. All right. Um, and I always feel like I'm just talking a lot. I know some of you are probably typing questions to, um, uh, so, which is great. Keep typing the questions. I just uh, wish we, were, we could all be in person and engaging. Um, so I want to talk about stigma. As I, I mentioned in the beginning, stigma is something that society essentially puts on a topic or a person or a thing. And in this case, it's mental health. So um, in general, stigma is the societal disapproval of something or when society places shame on people who live with mental illness or who seek help for emotional distress. So it's not just the illness itself. Sometimes there is stigma placed on individuals that are known to seek help for that emotional distress um, and both, both can be harmful. Um, stigma can come from everywhere. It does, it's not just one thing or one person. It could be friends, family, coworkers, general society. It could be commercials we see on television ads on Facebook. Um, stigma can come from a lot of places and it can happen really quickly. We may, may not think that we believe a certain way about mental health, um, but then we find ourselves having this like internal uh, conversation when we hear about it or we hear about someone that has a mental illness. So what stigma does is it prevents people from seeking care. So it prevents people living with mental illness from getting help from fitting into society and from leading happy and comfortable lives. And I know that sounds like a bold statement, but if someone feels like they can't seek help because they're gonna get made fun of, um, then they are not living a life 
that is satisfactory to them. Um, so stigma often comes from stereotypes that are usually inaccurate. They may be negative and they may even be offensive. So when we think of mental health or mental illness even, um, we have an idea of what that looks like. If someone says, oh, that's a mentally ill person, um, depending on what movies you've watched, what television you've engaged in, what books you've read, um, what the cultural norms are in, um, around mental illness, that could look really different. And so oftentimes though, they aren't necessarily accurate. It's just something that's been passed down. Um, and other people's judgments almost always come from a lack of understanding um, and usually come from stigma instead of actual facts or information. So even though mental illness is something that is common, um, the stigma associated with it um, is often blown out of proportion. It's something that people um, have ideas about that wouldn't necessarily um, be true or accurate to the vast majority of people who are experiencing mental illness. All right, so um, thinking about yourself um, and the ways in which you may um, have a stigma against individuals with mental illness, any ideas that you may have about mental health. Um, so this list is sort of for individuals who may be experiencing stigma because they have their own mental illness or mental health um, issues that they wanna work through. Uh, so one of the biggest things is seeking treatment. And while um, being labeled or feeling a certain way um, can definitely prevent someone from doing that, there are ways, especially kind of in the world and society we live in with technology, where it is something that someone can do very confidentially. Um, so definitely don't let people prevent um, an individual from seeking treatment. Um, and as someone, if you are someone that uh, knows someone, you can provide support for them. You can say, how are you doing? How has that been going? Um, you don't have to hear details, but you can be encouraging and say, I'm so glad that you're doing what feels good for you. Um, so another thing that stigma does is it creates our own internalized ideas that may have self-doubt or shame for ourselves. So one thing to work through it is to not let that happen. And obviously that's easier said than done. Um, but in a way, if you believe that mental illness is a bad thing or that people with mental illness are negative, um, it's gonna be a lot harder for an individual to seek treatment for themselves. Another thing is to not isolate. Um, again, especially during COVID, especially in uh, kind of the state of the world right now, this is really, really hard. Um, but reaching out to people and individual trusts, being that trustworthy person. So again, you don't have to um, know all of the things, but just being a person that someone can talk to can be a really powerful tool to help kind of break through that stigma. Um, so this is a really big one, um, not equating yourself or equating an individual with their illness. So someone is experiencing a mental illness or they have a mental illness, they are not that mental illness. So an example um, that's really common is that you're like, oh, that person is bipolar. Um, they are not bipolar, right? Like that's not who they are inherently. It is something that they have. It's something that they experience. Um, just like a person who breaks their leg is not a broken leg. Um, they have a broken leg, but they are not that. So that's one way that um, is kind of a language shift, but it's a way for us to try and break through that stigma by reminding us that this is an illness. It's something that people have. It is not who they are. Um, another uh, way that people can work through this is to join a support group. So uh, support groups are all over. They can be online, they can be in person, um, they can be anonymous, um, especially online. They can be um, something that you talk in, that you don't talk in. Um, the internet, while of course can be problematic, has a lot of really great resources for mental health and for people to come together and talk about it. Um, there's also been some really great um, agencies that have done wonderful work around this. Um, there's lots of organizations that focus explicitly on um, busting stigma around mental health. Um, and so also, again, if you're not the person that has a mental illness, but you know somebody, 
this is another way to encourage them to seek help. And then the biggest one at the bottom here for all of us that are in this space, um, I feel like it may be a safe assumption that if you showed up, um, your goal is to learn a little bit more about mental health. And so one of the things that we can all do is to talk about it. Um, so talking about mental health is the first step, whether it be coming to a presentation like this, just having conversations um, with friends, with family members, learning more about what people in your life, um, their feelings about it. Um, also, and then if you want to get get into some bigger movements, um, the elected officials have a lot of say in how we receive treatment. And so if it's something you're passionate about, reach out to your elected officials. You can also, you know, write anonymous letters to the editor. You can get involved in local movements to increase awareness. Um, there's also uh, groups online. Uh, some of the support groups don't have to be just for individuals who have a um, or are experiencing something, but they can also be for um, allies and advocates. So there's lots of things to do, lots of ways to get involved. Um, Pre-COVID world, there was always like a 5K going on. Um, Seattle has a lot of um, local agencies that provide support, um, but there's so many things to do. So if, if anyone is interested, I'd be more than happy to connect, connect you with a group or something um, if you would like to get more involved. Um, so now that we've kind of talked a little bit about stigma um, and talked about the US, I want to go worldwide. Um, now, granted, this information um, that I'm going to share is what we have available. Um, I do want to mention that, of course, it's often un unreported or underreported. So these are some sometimes best guesses. So um, mental illness can impact anyone at any time, and that's around the world. Um, worldwide, mental health conditions cause one in five years lived with disability. So what that's saying and what that kind of means is that um, oftentimes someone will live one in five years with a mental health condition, um, especially if they have other disabilities. So they often go hand in hand. 20% um, of the world's children and adolescents have a mental health condition. Um, suicide is the second leading cause of death among 15 to 29 year olds. And suicide is directly correlated with an individual's mental health. Um, however, so knowing all of those above statistics, um, the global expenditures on mental health and mental health treatment is less than 2%. Um, so if we think about how giant, of course, the world economy is, um, that's not very much money put to something that impacts one in four adults. Um, and then, as I've said before, the true prevalence of mental illness remains poorly understood because it's often underreported and underdiagnosed. There's also lots of communities out there um, that we're not able to talk to about this for whatever reason, whether it be access, um, whether it be other um, barriers, communication, those types of things. So these are kind of best guesses. Um, so again, best guesses, but this is from um, the WHO. So if we look at the darker areas, so the darker shades of red and orange, that is where um, mental health has been um, reported at higher levels. So although um, this looks like there's a lot of areas of the world that don't experience it very much, um, there's a lot of underdiagnosis or unreported uh, things that go on, especially worldwide. Um, so this is just kind of an idea, also to show that this happens everywhere. So this is not something that's isolated to the United States. This is something that is worldwide um, and again, mental health can happen anytime to any individual. Um, and there are lots of countries doing a lot of different things um, to help engage people in care. Um, so of course, I, I wanna talk about cultural considerations, also acknowledging that, of course, I am not the expert on anyone's culture. Um, only an individual can be an expert on their culture. And so um, attitudes towards mental illness vary greatly. Um, and that's from individuals, families, ethnicities, cultures, countries. Um, it could even vary from neighborhood to neighborhood, depending on where someone lives. Um, everyone's experience with mental health is unique. Anyone's experience with mental illness is also unique. And so before, when I was talking about how um, 
mental illness is something that's quote unquote diagnosable. Um, in the United States, it can only be diagnosed out of one book. Now, knowing that um, it's not the best standard of care, um, it's something that unfortunately we have to work within usually for insurance purposes. And that even though this book does have a lot of research and data, it doesn't mean that that's how anyone is gonna experience um, their mental illness. So I just want everyone to recognize and, and be aware that it can look very different. Um, there may be a million reasons why someone either can't seek help, doesn't want to seek help, has barriers to seeking help. Um, so we want to make sure that people are aware of it, but we also want to acknowledge that can be really difficult. Um, and then we all have our own personal beliefs, um, and that is totally okay. And we want to make sure that personal beliefs um, and stigmas aren't getting in the way of someone else wanting to be heard, of someone else wanting to be understood. Um, and again, if it's something you're not comfortable with, it's, it's totally okay to have someone, um, you know, like offer them a referral to someone else who may be more comfortable having that discussion. Um, so in the same vein, we want to set aside negative judgments. Um, so be mindful of the language that you use, be mindful of expressions. One of the best examples of language, again, is instead of saying that someone is something, it is something that they have. So we want to be mindful of all of those things. And of course, this is just the first step. Um, we're not asking anyone to be experts. We're not asking all of you to go out and be, be perfect in, in this at all. But this is just a way, a way to start the conversation. Um, again, if we go back to the stigma slide, which you don't have to do, Diana, but um, if, if we think back to the stigma slide about just talking about mental health, um, that is a really great first step to getting through stigma and, and even um, talking about cultural considerations, um, listening and really understanding how someone's experiencing mental health or mental illness can be um, just as impactful. Um, so I know that everyone is, is muted, but um, we have four questions. And so just think to yourself what the answers are. So if you want to pop up the first one, and these are all true, false. So true or false, mental illness is not common. False. False. Correct. Um, it is false. Um, mental illness is something, as you all have seen. Um, mental illness is something that is common. Um, it's one in four adults, at least in the United States. And because of underreporting, we believe it's actually more than that. All right, so the next one. Culture is a key influence in how we understand health, health care options, and decisions. True. true. That is true. Um, so as I kind of briefly mentioned, um, every Every culture is different. Every person has their own belief systems. Um, and that is wonderful. And we want to acknowledge those. We want to lean into those. Um, it also plays a role in how, how we work through the medical system, especially in the United States, for example, because uh, it's not always easy. All right. So reducing stigma is the job of people with mental illness. False. False. That is false. False. So um, as we kind of talked about, uh, mental health is something that is, it's difficult to talk about. Um, people with a mental illness um, are already experiencing the stigma. And so um, it is the job of all of us, um, of all, all of us who are working on promoting this and talking about it um, to kind of reduce that stigma. It's not to say that someone who's experienced it can't also do that. Um, but we do want to get to a place where it can be talked about um, in a safe and uh, like comforting environment. All right, so mental health needs have increased since the start of COVID. True. True, yes, absolutely true. And again, it's only it's been a year. And so we do have some information, but we don't know uh, the full impact of what COVID is going to do to the collective mental health. Um, we don't know the long lasting impacts it's gonna have on mental health. So it's something that we are going to continue um, 
you know, I'll, I'm kind of trying to stay on top of things and, and read up on as much as I can about it in, in working with clients on mental health, but it is definitely having an impact. All right, so I wanna thank everybody. Um, I'm at the end of my slides. We're not quite done with the presentation because we can open it up to Q&A. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to send me an email, which is on the screen right now. Um, also, uh, neighborhood house uh, development team, if, if you like misplace my email or anything, they can also get emails to me. So feel free to contact them as well. Um, so I think, um, oh yes, we also have some resources. So there's gonna be, there's a lot more resources than this, but I wanted to put up some of the bigger ones. So uh, King County has a very large resource page. Um, if you're looking for something not through the county, uh, there's a great website for finding a private mental health provider. I have the information for crisis services, which is for anyone um, to call. And then there are two resources for specifically for um, uh, multicultural or BIPOC community folks um, to access counselors. Um, I think that's all for the slides. I'll uh, throw it over to Arturo for a second, and then I think we can open up Q&A. Thank you, Leah, for the presentation. And yeah, we want to open it up uh, for all questions. Uh, just a reminder, people can submit uh, confidential questions to Janelle if you go on the drop down of Janelle, the co-host. Um, or uh, feel free right now if you want to turn on your camera and ask in person. Um, we welcome that. Please try to try your best to not share any personal, confidential, or medical information. And I actually want to get started with Janelle. Um, with any questions that came through the chat while the presentation was happening. Thanks, Arturo. Yeah, I did get a couple of questions in the chat. Um, Leah, one of them is, how do I find my baseline or norm for my mental health? And then a follow-up question for that is, how do you know when it is time to ask for help? Yeah, those are really great questions. And um, I wish I could give like one <laughs> comprehensive answer, but the, the, the true answer is that, um, you know yourself best. So if we kind of look at the very broad definition of mental health, um, if you feel that your everyday activities, so things that you quote unquote normally can do well, so whether that be feeding yourself um, general hygiene, so bathing, teeth washing, those types of things, um, getting out of bed, showing up to whatever your um, uh, commitments are on time, if those seem to start being more difficult, um, if you're not sure why that's happening, if you feel like um, I can't quite seem to get through my day in the same way as I could before, that's a really great time to start reaching out. It doesn't mean that you have a mental illness. Um, everyone experiences periods where their mental health is not as great. Um, it doesn't, you don't need to have a mental illness to seek therapy or even to seek help. Um, and so anytime that you just feel like your normal day to day is just not going as well, that's when I would recommend um, reaching out. Thank you, Leah. Um, the next question is, does the term behavioral health refer to mental health or is it broader? Uh, it does. And so the, the language around it is complicated. Behavioral health um, usually means mental health. It depends on the, the place, but most of the time that behavioral health and mental health are interchangeable. Oftentimes people say, well, behavioral health includes substance use um, treatment or disorder, and it absolutely does. And that's also considered mental health. So they're all together. Um, there's no wrong way, you know, you can say behavioral health um, and we know that it is referring to mental health. Um, and then what is the cost of mental health treatment? Um, again, I wish I could have one <laughs> comprehensive answer, but it varies greatly. Um, so depending on your insurance, um, if an individual has insurance, um, a lot of times insurance will cover a certain percentage of it. It is rare for insurance to cover 100% of mental health or behavioral health treatment, unfortunately, um, which is definitely a barrier for a lot of people. There are a lot of places um, in King County and in Seattle that do offer lower cost accessible services for individuals who, um, whose insurance may be too high. Um, but the, the cost varies. So it could be 
on average, it's about $100 a session if you're going with a private mental health provider. Um, but again, insurance would cover at least a portion of that if that, if that provider accepts your insurance. Um, that can get us into a big rabbit hole, so I'll just kind of leave it at that. <laughs> Thanks, Leah. And uh, Rekha has their hand up. Hi, hi. Um, it's Rika, and I had a question. Well, I don't know if it's my a apologies, Rika. Don't you worry about it. it happens all the time. <laughs> um, I recently watched a documentary where um, a family had lost their sister, who was a doctor. She was. I believe in working in the ER and she committed suicide. And in the documentary, it started to divulge information that these types of doctors um, are stigmatized if they seek the help, you know, like counseling. And I'm wondering if you knew anything more about that because what it did for me, and this is a recent um, viewing of this documentary, it makes me not want to see doctors who think it's negative to seek counsel. I mean, they're, they're playing God every day. And it only makes sense for them to, you know, depress with someone. But um, is that, are you, have you heard any research on that? Um, is there anything that can help take away the anxiety and knowing that the person who's playing God doesn't seek counsel? <laughs> yeah, and that's a great question. It's something that comes up really frequently, even within the therapy, therapist community. Um, I often tell friends that I think everyone's therapist should have a therapist. Um, because it's something that definitely needs support. Um, and so I definitely hear what you're saying, Rika. Um, it's really hard to know because it is private medical information. So they don't have to tell you uh, legally. Um, so your doctor doesn't have to tell you that. However, uh, a lot of times that stigma, so like the doctor from the ER, there's this idea that people who are in those kind of like higher medical positions don't have problems <laughs> or like don't have mental health um, happen to them um, because they're either like so smart or they have MD after their name. Um, and again, mental health exists for every person. Everyone that is in this presentation right now, you all have mental health, just like you all have physical health. Um, we all experience it. And so um, I, I'm so sorry to hear about that situation because that's just so unfortunate that someone in an ER who is, that's an obviously high stress job, um, is not seeking care for their own self. Um, and so my recommendation is that it's okay to be like, look, this is really important to me. Um, I wanna make sure that um, like you as a provider support me in mental health. I wanna make sure that in general you support mental health. Um, and if they don't, then that's a great reason to be like, thanks for your honesty. I'm going to look for someone else. And that's okay. That's your right um, to do that. Thank you, Leah, for that, um, that perspective, because I will be asking <laughs> yeah. moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's okay to ask, like, how do you feel about it? And if they feel like mental health isn't real, then that's a big red flag. Right. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Um, do, are there any other questions out there? I did have one. Um, okay. Any idea of how to educate and or normalize the conversation so that the individuals who are experiencing mental illness do not feel uh, uh, any type of fear or self-consciousness about admitting their difficulties? Yeah, thanks, Dan. That's a great question. Um, the hard part is that you you may have to have some difficult conversations or you may experience some really intense pushback from people um, as you start these conversations. Like if you just, you know, out of nowhere, you're just hanging out and all of a sudden you're like, let's talk about mental health. That might bring some interesting reactions. People may be like, oh no, we don't talk about that or um, have different feelings about it. I think one of the best ways, again, is just to start the conversations, um, especially if you're talking more about clients or about um, people in your life that you may not be as close to. Um, another good way is the developing a relationship with them, um, knowing, letting them know that you are a trustworthy person and proving that to them through actions. So it's, it's, it's one thing to show up and say, I am trustworthy. Um, anybody could do that. 
but to show up and, and be like, I am here to help. I want you to know that I'm here to help. Um, a lot of times we, you can't just do it right off the bat, right? We can't just be like, hey, how are you doing? I'm trustworthy. How's your mental health? right? That's not um, a casual conversation that we can often have with people. Um, so really, it's about building rapport. It's about building that trust and confidence. And then as you get into the harder conversations, um, acknowledging that, you know, saying this is sometimes a hard topic for people to talk about. I want you to know that while I may not be an expert, it's something that I support you in and I, I want to help. Um, so just being honest, naming it, naming that this is hard, naming that, um, you know, and, and hearing them, like, what do you think about mental health? Um, it's important to understand where they're coming from, too. So those are some of the suggestions I would have. But you definitely can't just kind of like go in hard. Um, it's about building, building that relationship. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, nothing else has come through the chat. Are there any other questions? I want to uh, say a comment. Like, um, I would say, I don't know, sometimes uh, depends where you work. The police uh, can be a little strict, or I feel like sending out message like inviting us to look for mental health or like use any resource is good but I feel like we need to go a little one more step in front like if I am the supervisor or a person who can know a change in somebody I think it's good to come and say are you doing anything like a simple conversation? Yes, because if we don't do this, uh, that message in front of us cannot do nothing. Like we cannot take the courage to like um, Rick, like Ricky was saying, like we can't take that time and make the call and say, I need help. But if we have this person who we now believe they really care about us and come say, how are you doing? Uh, is everything okay with you? Or like, like a simple conversation, yes. But I think it's the moment when that person can maybe be open and share something and maybe that person just need to put out all the, the, like the things is caring. And sometimes we just need that, that space and and I don't know, just feel like if we can do this more often, like I'm I'm a, a simple co-worker, yes, but I think coming from a person who is our tap is really helpful. Like when that person takes that moment and separate work from the reality, like I notice this person is changed or I see is getting upset more often or is getting more like, quiet than before. I think I will find the, the space to to have a conversation or I don't know. Just I just wanted to put this up. Thank you so much. Thanks, Joni. Thank you. Yeah, and you're right, Joni, we need to talk about it more and even especially in workspaces. And um, I mean I can only speak for myself and, and the team that I uh, work with, but um, I encourage folks to take care of their mental health. Um, you know, we don't, I don't need to be told the reasons, like people don't have to come to me and tell me what they're experiencing. Um, but I also encourage them, you know, we have, we're lucky enough here at Neighborhood House to have sick days. And I, I encourage people to take them as needed. It's not just for um, physical health, it's mental health as well. And um, yes, definitely, as Joni said, we need to check in with each other, because um, it's not easy. COVID especially has, has increased a lot of that, but, um, you know, ask friends, ask neighbors, people that you're close with. Um, again, it's all about relationships and even asking is helping to break down that stigma because it's opening up a door that says like, if you want to come in, you're welcome to. So um, those are things that we can all do. Um, small steps, again, this is not going to change overnight, but it's something that we can all do together.
Thank you, Leah. Um, there is another resource that somebody sent me in a chat and then Arturo uh, had his hand up. Um, but the resource, this comment says, I'd like to recommend a great resource, the National Alliance for Mental Illness or NAMI. NAMI. There is a Washington state chapter as well as a local NAMI affiliates in Seattle on the east side and elsewhere. You don't need a diagnosis to access NAMI resources. They offer presentations, classes, online resources, and support groups for people with mental illness and for their family members and friends, all free of charge. Yes, thank you. NAMI is a great resource. Um, and they are all over the United States. So. Um, and then another question just came through the chat. What is the early common symptom of mental health? Great question. Um, there's not one answer to that. Um, so the some of the most common, and I'm speaking again in very broad generalities here, um, are some like sort of what I already spoke to about your daily activities. You, you don't seem to be able to do them in the same way. So if you notice that your hygiene is slipping, if you're sleeping too much or sleeping not enough, and it's not attributed to something like let's say you're a student or a new parent, it makes sense that your sleep would be a little different. But if you feel like you're on the same routine and suddenly you can't sleep for many days in a row or you are sleeping a lot, like let's say you normally sleep eight hours, but now you need like 10 to 12 um, to feel like you're rested, that, that is often a sign. Um, also appetite. So if you feel like you've either lost appetite or suddenly have a huge increased urge, um, and again, this is generalities. I don't want to say that it also couldn't be something physical, but if we're talking about mental health, that is one of the items. And then also sort of loss of focus. So if you feel like you just can't seem to concentrate, um, you're in a space where things may, may just feel like, oh, I can't focus on anything. Um, a lot of times that might be earlier signs, um, but really anything that's out of your normal. So some people, um, may experience there you're all going to experience things differently but if it's outside of your normal those are are things to pay attention to thank you leah um thank you so much thank you uh, the reason which uh, i am asking is it is difficult most of the time difficult to identify whether it is mental health or not so i get the right answer thank you so much yeah, absolutely. And mental health, you know, and physical health are very closely related and sometimes can impact each other. And so um, there's something called psychosomatic, which is where we physically feel something that is impacted by our mental health. Um, and so we can have very real physical symptoms um, as a product of a mental illness. Mm -hmm. um, so always talk to your doctor, but they are very closely tied. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Arturo? Yeah, I had a question. Um, so you mentioned uh, just like the, the demand being so high and things like that. And I'm wondering in your experience if you've noticed or if there's data on how often or the average visits that someone ha usually has before they find the counselor that works for them. Um, just because sometimes like you need someone immediately or sometimes you're it's like looking for you know anybody else you want that person to connect with so on average how do you know how many counselors people go through or if it's you know common to go through a few to find the person that really fits your needs it's a great question um i don't have data on like an average or anything from my experience um there are a lot of barriers to mental health care. So often people find the first therapist they can and then they stay with them regardless of fit, which makes sense because I, it is hard. It is difficult to find someone that is within a price range. Sometimes people are limited to therapists that only accept their insurance regardless of fit. Um, I am very grateful that I currently work for an agency that is an accessible clinic. And so um, I always encourage my clients and anybody that I talk to, um, just because a person has the credentials as a therapist doesn't mean they're the right person for you. Um, I have absolutely had clients where we both agreed that it wasn't a good fit for whatever reason, um, but it is still my role to help them find a good fit. And so um, 
I would say people, I, I tell people to try it out. You know, you're, you do not have to stay with that therapist if you don't want to. Of course, there are a lot of barriers to why you might want to stay with them. Um, but you can absolutely shop around for a therapist. Um, the most, I mean, most people usually know after seeing one person what they absolutely don't want or absolutely do want. And so usually the second time or the third time is much easier. Um, but there's no limit. However, on the flip side, if someone bounces around to 10 therapists, that's a bigger conversation because <laughs> I think that's less about the therapist and more about something going on with the individual. Thank you so much, Leah. Uh, looks like um, that kind of concludes our time for today. Uh, thank you again for sharing your knowledge, experience, and bringing awareness to mental health in our communities. Um, to everyone on the call, we'll send our contact, uh, Leah's contact information, slides, uh, survey, um, and an email to everyone. We appreciate everyone who took the time to join us today. This is just one of many ways to help connect with us here at Neighborhood House and our journey to become a stronger advocates for our communities. Uh, look out for another email announcing the date for part two to take a deeper dive into this mental health series with Leah. Uh, you can also follow us on uh, social media and look out for the invite there. Uh, check out our website for, you know, if you want to stay connected, ways to volunteer uh, and engage or uh, make a gift to help continue programs and events like this. Um, thank you everyone again, a uh, big shout out to the team that put this together and happy give big day everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Leah.